I want to go ahead and start tonight. I appreciate everybody being here. I don't have any uh, extra announcements, so I will just go ahead and get started. Uh, Alan Tackett's going to come and lead us in an opening prayer, and then Sam has the, the singing tonight, and I'm going to deliver the short devotional here in just a minute. Alan? Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful for what you've done for us and thankful to be called your children. We're grateful for everything you do for us, including our jobs, the cars that we drove here today in, and the, the food that we eat, the money that you provide to us. Help us remember all these things belong to you, and ultimately you hold us responsible for how we use them. Be mindful of those who are sick tonight, those who couldn't be with us. Pray you watch over them and that we would have compassion on them, reach out to them and show them that we love them. Father, we know there are people who are not here by choice, and whatever their life circumstances are, we pray that we would you give us the strength to reach out to them, show them that we care about them, show them that they, they, they belong with us as well. Be with us tonight. Pray that we're making you proud of who we're becoming. Help us help make us more like Christ. And we pray this thing in Jesus' name. Amen. When the Savior calls, I will answer. before we moved here, I was working out in our garage doing Taibo. Uh, it's an old workout people used to do with Billy Blank. It was like a karate uh, version of exercising. And I was getting close to the end of the exercise, and my nose started to bleed. And I was thinking, you know, I'm almost done. I really want to finish this exercise. So I kept going, even though my nose was bleeding. So I finished the exercise, and uh, at the end, I realized the nosebleed had gotten a lot worse. And I just had blood everywhere. I mean, it was all over me. I looked like I just murdered my entire family. And, uh, and I thought to myself, you know, if I would have stopped when there were signs, you know, the original signs, there would have been no problem. I would have gone clean up my nose, came back in there, and everything would have been fine. But because I put it off, there was a mess. I had to throw away some clothes. I had to take a shower. If I would have just noticed the signs, then disaster wouldn't have happened. I think about when my... My low pressure light, low tire light comes on in my car. If I keep ignoring it and keep ignoring it, then eventually I'm going to find myself on the side of the road with a flat tire because I kept ignoring the signs. I don't know how many people in my life that I've known in church, and I'll hear, I'll hear this someday. They'll, I'll hear, uh, I cannot believe that person left the church. I cannot believe that person is gone. But you see, there were signs. There were signs throughout the years. Maybe they'd miss a few things that you know they probably should have been at. Maybe they just weren't themselves. They didn't seem like they were getting anything spiritually out of what we were doing. You know, part of our jobs as Christians is to look out for those signs with each other. That's the whole point of the church. The church is so that we have other people to lean on when we fall off course. Philippians 2, 
uh, verse 3 and 4, Paul says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. We have a responsibility for others. That's the point of the church, is that we have people to steer us back on course when we fall off. You see, we've got to look for these signs now, because it's a lot easier to steer somebody back on course who's here than to pull somebody who's already left back on course. That's, that's a lot more difficult. So we need to keep our eyes open. We need to be aware. Who's not here? Who is not acting like themselves? Who, who is clearly struggling? What are, who are, what are some signs that we're seeing? And what can we do to bring these people back on track before we lose them for good? Let's look for those signs now so we don't, so we don't lose them later. Whatever your need is tonight, I hope you'll come. Uh, we're, we're here for you. Whatever your need is, right now, it's together we stand and sing. asked me to do the class tonight I was well and healthy and <laughs> and uh, then we got sick last week Nita and I both she's still not doing as well but uh, uh, it was a struggle to, to get something together but I, I decided to do it on a Bible character uh, and for some reason I got stuck on Judas is carrot. Uh, one of my first thoughts was, can I make a whole class about this character? Uh, it, and I may not. <laughs> we may get out early tonight. <laughs> but anyway, we'll start uh, in uh, Matthew 26. 14 through 16. Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver, and from that moment he sought an opportunity to betray him. You know, the name Judas... Uh, when you hear that name, you, that's who you think of, Judas Iscariot. But there was uh, other Judases uh, in Mark 6 and 3, uh, speaking about Jesus. Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are, they not his, are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. So... Jesus had a brother named Judas. Uh, in Luke 6, 14 through 16, when we uh, see the list of the, of the apostles there, Judas is not the only Judas listed. There's Judas the son of James listed in verse 16. Uh, of course, other places... That Judas has another name. And when you start doing the process of elimination, you see that Thaddeus is also the, the man that's called Judas, the son of James. And so uh, there are several Judases. Uh, you might notice, though, uh, the 12 names that are listed here you know, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, uh, James, Thaddeus, 
Simon. Those were all common names today. You don't ever hear anybody call Judas today. That's, that's not a very popular name. But it was back in the first century. It was a very popular name. And the reason it was is there was a Jewish hero, Judas Maccabee, that was uh, a couple hundred years before this. Was uh, He was a priest, but he was also a, a great leader and warrior. And he ended up driving the uh, the last of the Greek dynasty out of out of the area there, and so the Jewish people uh, really revered Judas Maccabee. In fact, they still celebrate a holiday today. Uh, I'm sure you've heard of it, Hanukkah. Hanukkah is not a religious holiday for the Jews. Hanukkah is a is a celebration of a, a victory, a, a battle victory over the Seleucid, which is the Greek uh, armies there. But he drove them completely out of the country. Uh, in Acts 15, uh, verse 22, there's a Judas that was chosen. Uh, by the church to to be sent sent to Antioch, uh, his name was Judas Barsabbas, and uh, he went with Silas and uh, and with Paul and Barnabas uh, on mission trip there. And so, although there were several Judases, the the one we're going to concentrate is the the one that betrayed Christ. Uh, recently, I say recently, it's actually been a few years ago, there was a, a book pop published, it was called The Gospel of Judas. And they thought that this book was written in the second century by Gnostics. And you may remember the, the Gnostics, they were an enemy of Christ back in the in the first century, uh, especially John fought them. Uh, but the Gnostics wrote this book and, and it, it made Judas to be out a hero instead of a, a villain. He was, he was talked about as uh, the only one who understood Christ and, uh, and that Jesus instructed Judas to turn him over to the, to the soldiers. Well, that's not what the Bible says. So we'll, what we want to do tonight is just look at the Bible and see what the Bible actually tells us about Judas. Uh, first of all, every time that the apostles are listed, uh, here's eight examples right here, eight different verses. Judas is included as an apostle. He was an apostle. And because he was an apostle, he traveled with Jesus. And uh, Luke 8 and 1, talking about Christ, said soon afterward he went on through cities, villages, proclaiming and, and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve were with him. So Judas is one of the twelve, and he was with Christ during all this preaching. Now, Jesus' ministry is about three and a half years. That's about 1,300 days. And other than the times when the apostles were sent out, couple of instances. He was there with Christ and listened to all the teaching. Uh, he heard all the parables. He heard the, the gospel and the, and the kingdom being uh, preached, the coming of the kingdom. Uh, when Christ gave the parable of the sower, gave the apostles the meaning, 
told them the meaning in Mark 4. And, and I just wonder what was going through Judas's mind when he was talking about, you know, the, the seed being sown in the thorns. Uh, it, did he know at that time that he was going to do something wrong? Well, he was taught that the last should be first, according to Mark 9, 35. And he foretold, he was foretold about Jesus' betrayal at least three times, maybe more. Uh, for 1,300 days, more or less, he heard Jesus' teaching. And Jesus chose him as an apostle. Uh, we don't know, we're not told all of those days. Actually, in the Bible, there's only about less than 30 days of Jesus' life recorded. When you get to counting up the days uh, and, and synchronize the, the gospel, there's only about 30 days that we actually are told about Jesus' life. But anyway, we know that Mark 10 and 1, that Jesus called to him the 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. Was Judas one of the 12? Yeah. So Jesus gave Judas the power, the authority over unclean spirits. He gave him the, the ability to heal diseases, every disease, it says. And then it goes on down. Do I have to help you, Larry? There we go. Thank you. Um, it says that Jesus sent them out. It says, Go nowhere among the Gentiles or enter no town of the Samaritans, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons, you received without paying, give without pay. And so here Judas is, he's one of the twelve, he's active in the ministry, he's spreading the word, he's healing the sick, it even says raise the dead. And then uh, Mark 6 and 7, this is a, another time. It said he called the 12, that's Christ, and began to send them out two by two, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits. Later in that chapter, it'll also say that he gave them authority to, to, uh, to heal to perform miracles. They're confirming the word. That's what the miracles are for, to confirm the word, to show that the word that they were speaking was true. And Judas is in the middle of this. He's doing it. He's taking part. In Mark 12, it says, So they went out and proclaimed that the people should repent, and they cast out many demons, and were anointed, and anointed with all many who were sick, and healed them. Here again, Judas is right there with them. He's doing this.
Okay. When they saw Jesus heal a, heal a man, the uh, Pharisees began to say that he was doing that by the, by the uh, authority of Beelzebub, the devil, Satan. In Matthew 12, 24 through 26, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, it is only by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, that this man cast out demons. Knowing their thoughts, he said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? So Jesus makes it clear that if you have the power to cast out demons, that you don't, it's not Satan doing it. He makes it clear here. So if, if Judas is casting out demons, by what power is he doing it? Well, it has to come from God. That power has to come from God. Help me there, Larry. In Acts one twenty five, Matthias is being chosen as the new apostle. It says it's to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside. So he was in the ministry, in the apostleship, and he turned aside. I actually like the uh, King James, what the King James says here. He said, it's, it reads that he may take part in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas, by tra transgression, fell, that he might go to his own place. To fall, you've got to be up before you can go down. 2 Corinthians 10 and 12, Paul is, is uh, cautioning the Christians. Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Christians can fall. I have a little trouble sometimes getting that across over in Romania. I've got one man that I've been working with now for a year <laughs> And I still can't make him understand that. He's hung up on once saved, always saved. Galatians 5 and 4. This is church at Galatia. They're trying to make rules where God didn't make them. It said, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. You can't fall away from grace unless you're in grace. You have to be in grace to fall away from grace. And so it looks like we have proof that before he was a betrayer, that Judas was actually a, a faithful disciple of Jesus. He was a true apostle. <clears throat> but he does turn out to be a betrayer. We know that he started stealing from the from the the uh, money that that the, the apostles lived off of. He was the keeper. In John twelve and six, he questioned when Mary used an expensive ointment on Jesus' feet. And he said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief and having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. So he's turning bad.
And finally, well, before I, we get to that, let me let me make this observation. Uh, he was seemed to be motivated by greed. He was wanting money. But when he first became an apostle, he joined up with Jesus and a group of guys that had nothing. I mean, he didn't join for the money. He couldn't have. There was no money there. And so that was not the reason originally, but being around money, Grady Gewin made a good observation to me one time. <laughs> he said it's, it's better not to put money out in front of people to pr provide temptation. He said just don't, don't let somebody, one person, be in charge of it. Don't let, uh, let more than one be involved. He said, the temptation is always going to be there. And Grady was a very wise man and, and one of my heroes in life. But eventually, he goes to the, uh, he goes to the, the priest and he says, what will you give me if I deliver you over to him? He's, he's wanting money. And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And I looked that up trying to find out how much that was. And I actually got a lot of different things off of the internet. It was anywhere from 200 to $400. That's not a lot of money. And that's in today's money. Anyway... We get down to to uh, to the fact that he is going to betray Jesus. In John six seven seventy and seventy one, Jesus foretells foretells this. He said, "Have I not chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil?" He spoke of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he was that he was it, it was for it, he it was that would betray him, being one of the twelve. In Matthew twenty six twenty one, as they were eating, he said, "Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me." And on down a few verses after that, Jesus, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? And he said, You have said so. John adds a little bit more. John said, Jesus answered, It is he whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. And so when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. So Jesus told him right then that, that, that he was going to be the one. You, you know, I don't know if, if uh, he made his mind up right then. He had already gone and, and offered to, to betray Jesus. Uh, it says, then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of, tw of the twelve. It says, Satan entered his heart. Satan can't force himself into our hearts. You have to invite him in. John said, during supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son to betray him. Romans 8 and 38 says, For I am sure that neither 
death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can come between you and, and Christ, you and God, but you. You can cause the devil to come into your heart. He can't force his way in. Luke 22, 4 through 6. And he went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how they might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. And he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of a crowd. Why would he want to do it in the absence of a crowd? Uh-uh, the people, they were, the Pharisees were scared of, they were scared to death of the, of the people. So they wanted to do it in secret. That's why they needed Judas. They wanted to do it in a place where nobody else was. You see, John 18 tells us when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew this place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. The Garden of Gethsemane was pretty large. It's a large, it's what we would call not a garden, we'd call it an orchard. It's olive trees. And it's a, several acres of olive trees. And Jesus would go there to rest. That's where they'd camp out at night. That's where they slept. It's where he went there to, to pray before his crucifixion. And so it was a big area. And uh, the Pharisees wanted to know how to go at night under the cover of night and go to him and arrest him. And that's exactly what happened. John 18, 3 and 4. So Jesus, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said, Whom do you seek? Now they're coming forward this big group of soldiers and the, and the priest and he walks up and says whom do you seek out of the darkness and they answered him Jesus of Nazareth and Jesus said to him I am he Jesus, Judas who betrayed him was standing with them and when Jesus said to them I am he they drew back and fell on the ground you remember the keystone cops This, that, I think this is amazing that they, they actually fell down. It scared them so much when it turned out to be Jesus. Matthew 26, 47 and 48, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd of, with swords and clubs and the chief priests and elders of the people now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. Oop, back me up one. And when he came to Jesus, it, at once said, greetings, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. 
And then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. He had betrayed him. That's not the end of the story, though. You see, Judas regretted what he did. Matthew 27, 3 and 4. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, (coughs) I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. And they said, what is this, that to us? See to it yourself. That's your problem, they said. I like what the King James says here. Then Jesus, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. Here Judas, it says Judas repented. And it also says he confessed. Confessed his sin. Was he forgiven? We have to look at it. The Greek word for repent is metanoia. But that's not the word that's used here. The word that's used here is metamelomea. And the idea is a change of heart that doesn't change a life. In other words, it's regret without a true change of character. The Bible talks about that. You know, there's more than one kind of sorrow. Uh, the ESV is on Second Corinthians 7 and 10, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. But, uh, again, I like the King James. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. There's the sorrow, godly sorrow, there's the worldly sorrow. A lot of times it's the sorrow of getting caught. But it's not one that changes the life. He did return the money. He threw down the the 30 pieces of silver into the temple and he departed and he went and hanged himself. We're told in Acts that that uh, now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem that the field was called in their own language Akeldama, that is, filled of blood. So the, the priest bought a field with it. it. They bought a potter's field, which is after the clay's dug, nothing else is going to grow there. It's pretty much a worthless piece of, of land. And, and uh, so they used it just to bury what we'd call homeless uh, people with no family to bury them. But you know, that night, there was another betrayal. It wasn't just uh, 
Judas and uh, it was Peter. The Lord told Peter he was going to deny him three times before the cock crowed. And he did. He did just that. And Peter had just said he'd do anything. He'd give his life. He'd do anything in the world. But he wouldn't betray him. But three times he betrayed him. And I love what Luke says. Luke says the, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And you can just... You can see the, the Lord in the, in, in the building where they're, they're accusing him and he looks back out the door and his eyes and Peter's eyes meet and Peter remembered what the Lord said. And it says he went away and wept bitterly. Now, he did repent, and he did change. In fact, he gave his life to Christ. You know, every time we sin, every time we do the same thing, we betray Christ. Every time we sin, and we can re respond to that in the way that Judas did without a change of character. Or we can respond to it the way Peter did. That's all I've got for tonight. And I didn't quite make it. I apologize. But uh, let's go ahead and go to God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you tonight. We thank you for all that you do for us and we know that it's overwhelming the, the things you do, the things you provide. We ask you, Lord, to, to bless all those who are hurting in this world. We know that there's many that are having hard times now, many that are fighting sicknesses and injuries and we know that there's many that are grieving and continue to grieve for lost loved ones. We know that there's many that are having financial difficulties and, and many that are facing emotional or mental problems in their life. For family problems, we know that that you're the only one that can answer prayers. And we appeal to you, Lord, to, to please intervene in these instances. We thank you, Lord, for all the physical and spiritual blessings that you, you give us. But most, most, Lord, we're mostly thankful for your grace. A grace that's so undeserving. And we know, Lord, it's through your grace that we can have that opportunity. That opportunity to accept your grace through obedience. And we can live for you. We thank you, Lord, for opportunities to serve you. To study your word and to approach you in prayer. And we're thankful, Lord, for your Son. And it's in His name we bring forth this prayer. Amen. Amen.